What's up everybody? Today I'm talking about how I hired a data scientist for my company, Interview Query, by applying data science to the hiring process. I wanted to make this video because it was the first time I was hiring for a data science role rather than searching for a data science job myself. It really opened my eyes to what it was like to hire data scientists and I want to explain how I architected the whole entire process from start to finish through a data-driven mindset. Let's take a look. If you guys are new here, my name is Jay. I worked as a data scientist for four years in Silicon Valley before quitting at the end of 2019 to start Interview Query, a platform which helps data scientists land jobs through learning and practicing data science problems. When we first started out over a year ago, it was just myself and my co-founder, Shane. Now we've grown our team and realized it was time to hire our first data scientist. Also, if you could smash that like button, I really appreciate it. Helps me out with these YouTube videos and encourages me to make a lot more. There were three main takeaways that I want to go over. The first one was defining the data science role and responsibilities. Knowing exactly what the data scientists will be working on is extremely important. Two was evaluating candidates at scale with automated testing and rubrics, and not endless resume reviewing and hiring manager calls. And three was creating a metrics-based hiring process for all parts of the funnel. So number one was defining the role. So why does Interview Query need a data scientist? Most companies, let alone two-person startups, definitely never need a data scientist. Data scientists are useful when businesses can actually increase VAT revenue by analyzing data or influence product direction, or by implementing machine learning on a large scale to increase metrics like engagement, retention, and revenue. This is usually done on huge platforms, marketplaces, e-commerce, all the things that Interview Query isn't. Additionally, as a small business, our priority for new feature development is mainly talking to our customers, because they usually have strong opinions about what we should be building. But as a data science education business, I felt it was necessary that someone else's entire job, besides mine, be focused on applying analytics and discovering interesting product insights and features. On top of providing data science education content, I wanted to apply data science to the business to improve our user's goal of learning data science itself. One example would be if we could sort our question feed by relevance to your job searching and learning goals. It's so meta. Defining the job goals. So why does everyone hate hiring? The biggest complaint I've heard from data science managers and recruiters is how painful the hiring process is. Either they're scanning through thousands of resumes or all the candidates they're interviewing get rejected or even bring someone on and then they quit within the first month because it's a bad fit. The issue is a misalignment in expectations in the job description and the interview process. You can't interview a data scientist and gush about product insights and then drill them on lead code. The first thing I did when writing the data scientist job description was to list a few projects that they would work on, like improving our newsletter, creating an A-B test system, etc. We made it clear why we needed a data scientist and then decided to make the position a paid internship role. The second was creating a hiring strategy. I followed a few tips that I learned in hiring over the few years for this. Tip number one is that when hiring a candidate, you should be eliminating 50% of the candidates at every step of the funnel. For example, if you're hiring for one role and you want to make two offers, then you would schedule four on-site interviews, eight technical screens, 16 hiring manager interviews based on resume or take-home exercises. It's like a binary search tree where the goal is to optimize your interview process for finding the best candidate in the shortest amount of time. To do that effectively leads to tip two, which is to understand the distribution of skills on the candidate pool. Once you set requirements for the job, including salary, hours, work style, and skill set expectations, you will receive a ton of candidates across the distribution of those values. To understand what a good candidate looks like, you have to also see what a bad candidate looks like as well. This means defining your baseline requirements in a candidate that is a yes hire. For us, we needed a data science intern that was well versed in product analytics and could work independently of us, but we didn't know that what the qualification was, was given we were hiring an intern at a pretty cheap rate. Our strengths were that we were a startup where we could mentor the data scientist directly, but we weren't sure of how much of a draw that was for app actually applications. Amazingly, after a week, we had over 500 candidates that applied. It was insane, and we ran into the main problem of hiring nowadays, which is measuring and filtering all the candidates without spending hundreds of hours interviewing everyone. How are we going to evaluate candidates accurately, without bias, and at scale? Well, what we did next was, dun dun dun, assign a take home challenge. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Jay, you've written about how you hate take home challenges. Oh my god, what have you done? My attitude was always predisposed towards hating take home challenges because I was interviewing on the candidate side. Truthfully, take-home challenges are great for employers because they allow the employer to evaluate candidates at scale. 
instead of conducting five individual technical screens, you could realistically review 50 take-home challenges in the same period of time. Additionally, I was motivated to find undervalued candidates. I think the easiest way to get false positives in hiring individual contributors is when employers overweight resume and previous experience versus actual skill. Take-home challenges are best when used as filtering and distribution mechanisms, while minimizing the conversion rate loss. For example, let's take a look at this graph. This graph represents take-home challenge effectiveness. The x-axis represents the length of the take-home challenge in hours, and the vertical axis represents the signal and data science skills we could theoretically obtain if the take-home complexity increased. My assumption is that while signal probably increases with take-home length, at some point it plateaus in effectiveness. Many times, data scientists will also overspend a lot of time on the take-home challenge, which can model the candidate comparisons. This second line is the conversion rate of candidates that would actually take the challenge. As the length of the challenge increases, the number of candidates that would complete the take-home challenge decreases, as expected. Our goal was to find the point between these two lines that maximizes the challenge effectiveness in evaluating skill while retaining most potentially qual qualified candidates. Given my previous negative experiences on take-home challenges, I decided that this maximized value should be a take-home that would last one hour and be simple enough for a qualified candidate to breathe through. Last note, as a candidate, you should still be willing to say no to take-home challenges if they are overly long or not a match for your skill set and job preference. If a company issues a take-home challenge, generally they're looking for a candidate who's a strong individual contributor. So I hosted the take-home on Typeform so that I could send the link to different candidates on Indeed and created three different problems in the take-home. At the end of the day, we set the take-home to 100 candidates after doing 200 plus resume reviews and received 70 assignment finishes for around a 70% completion rate on the take-home. Constructing the take-home challenge. As you can probably guess, 70 take-home assignments to review is still a lot of candidates and going through 70 take-home challenges is pretty tough. So how do you continue to filter candidates down while assessing skill? We approached this in two parts and created three questions that each served a different purpose. The first question was around basic analytics. The question was, given the data set above, what is the average number of comments per user divided by the average number of comments per commenter? This question was a little tricky, but to anyone that's ever had anything to do with analytics, this had to be an easy gimme. And yet, amazingly, only 58% of the candidates got the question correct. If candidate got this wrong, I would immediately discard the rest of their take home. A wrong answer here demonstrated that the candidate either wasn't observant enough, didn't care about the take home, or was just plainly bad at analytics. I'm not even gonna tell you guys what the right answer was. Please leave a comment of what you think it is. The second question was on SQL. This question was to test if the candidate could simply write a relatively simple query using a join. If they couldn't write correct SQL, then they wouldn't be able to pull data from our database. This question was also relatively easy to score. I had the example tables already in an interview query. I just had to run their solution in the editor, and if the right result came back, then they passed the SQL round. The main issue with this was that there were different SQL engines. Many people got the question right but missed some syntax, and so for the most part, I gave them a pass the solution was basically there. And about half of the candidates got this part of the question right as well. Lastly, the final and most important question was a product analytics case question. This question was, let's say you're a data scientist at YouTube focused on creators. A PM comes to you worried that amateur video creators could do well before, but now it seems like only superstars do well. What are two to three metrics that you would analyze to understand if this is the case? This question was possibly the most important. It allowed me to actually evaluate the candidates on a few grading rubrics. One was their analytical sense. Could they come up with metrics and analyses that actually made sense for the case study that would be interesting? Two was, did they understand any analytics within the framework of a content business? This question was great because it was a case study on a product everyone would know, YouTube, and it was about a situation that was tangentially similar to interview query. No, we don't have creators, but we do have lots of content, and I wanted to know how a candidate thought about content within a business. And lastly, I wanted to understand their level of communication of technical concepts. Communication and structure are both some of the most important skills a data scientist needs to know. If I can't communicate with you, then I can't work with you. For example, here was a good answer. The candidate describes the metrics that they wanted to use, outlines and clarifies who the amateur and superstar creators are, and understands to set up two timelines to compare these metrics against each other. This one is a bad answer. The candidate is essentially saying absolutely nothing. What are trending videos? What are categories? I didn't walk away with any insight. Ultimately, you can guess that a big factor in if a candidate actually passed the product question 
was based on how much they would write in the entry. And that's kind of what we want. We want more ideas, albeit good ideas, but ultimately someone that can think about the problem and identify a way to solve it with data. With this take home, we narrowed down the candidate list from the original 100 candidates that applied down to 10, eliminating 50% of the candidates at each subsequent interview question. Now, instead of calling 100 different candidates or just calling the top 10 based on resume experience, we found the most qualified candidates without having to talk to a single person. Lastly, the final step was to interview each candidate. And to be honest, this was probably the most surprising step for me. Because while I thought that I had found really qualified candidates, a lot of them weren't that great in person. A few didn't actually schedule an interview since they either got another internship or weren't interested. For the in-person interviews, I was grading each candidate on their communication skills, interest in the job, and then also a, the case study question. Additionally, I was trying to sense if the candidate in person matched their take home and skill assignment. The case study question I asked on the in-person interview was about improving the email newsletter that interview query sends out each week. It wasn't so much a real interview question, but rather the first project that the data scientist was supposed to work on. So in essence, it was more of a preview of what it would be like if we actually started collaborating together. The better they performed on this interview question, the more effective they would be on the job. When I talked to the eight or so candidates I eventually interviewed, about half of them weren't very strong in person. Some of them didn't know exactly what interview query actually did or had not signed up to even use the website. One of them even told me that his dad helped him write the sequel part. Other weak candidates just didn't have strong communication skills. And while they could string together thoughts in the writing section, I realized in-person communication can be much harder as it requires you to think on the spot in a discussion between two people. Eventually though, I interviewed one candidate that I liked so much, after a week I gave him the offer and he accepted. Here's an example of how our data science intern answered the email newsletter case study. I think there are three important metrics to look at. The first would be the open rate for the email newsletter. So user opens the email newsletter more, user is engaging with them more. The second metric, try to understand the correlation between the open rates of the email newsletter and the conversion of users from regular users to premium. Give us a good indication whether email newsletter itself is contributing to users going premium. The final metric is the click-through rate of users who have higher amount of engagement with the newsletter would tend to click on more links. Analyzing these three metrics would give us a good indication of the effectiveness of the newsletter. Lastly, I wanted to leave with a few takeaways from this whole process. One is make sure that your time is spent effectively when hiring. I see recruiters, hiring managers waste all their time emailing candidates, scheduling interviews, and fixing take-home assignments. It's important to always have a streamlined hiring process that you can replicate for each candidate in the future. I'm going to be using this process from now on whenever we hire anyone because I feel like I maximize the effective use of my time and it still restricts strong candidates in the end. Also, a lot of the time spent hiring is also spent context switching. So if you're emailing candidates and you're trying to schedule them and interview them, you don't really get a lot of work done at the same time. The second most important thing is to always define the role and set expectations up front. Play to your strengths as an employer. I told each candidate in the interview that we can't pay you that much, but I will directly mentor you and you'll contribute to actually moving the needle at our company. Our weakness as a startup is also our strength, and we ended up with an awesome intern because of it. Lastly, as a candidate, realize that you can get filtered out at any of these corresponding steps in the funnel. There are so many candidates that are applying for data science internship jobs out there and data science roles that in addition to this whole process, I simply added a piece of text at the bottom of the Indeed job description that said, if you see this text, please write it. I read the whole job description in the text box along with your resume. And out of 500 people, only five people actually wrote it in. So many candidates don't actually care about each job they apply to, but if you put in a little bit of effort, I think you can actually stand out. Lastly, as an employer, if you're interested in learning more about how to hire data scientists effectively, reach out to me and we'll talk about how interview query can help. And please, as always, if you're reviewing this video and you really enjoy it, please like and subscribe to my channel. Uh, I really appreciate it, and it lets me produce more of these really interesting videos to begin with. Thanks so much, and I'll see you guys next week.